Hello, uh, this is uh, Dr. Udatta Kher and I am uh, delighted to be a part of this uh, uh, virtual congress uh, for uh, the FDI and the IDA. Uh, my topic for today uh, is uh, one of my favorite topics uh, currently in dentistry which is uh, the art of partial extraction uh, therapy. I practice uh, in Mumbai, this is where I was born and brought up and I have completed all my formal education uh, here in Mumbai. Uh, including my master's in oral surgery at uh, the Government Dental College and Hospital uh, in Mumbai. Uh, this of course is an image of Mumbai before the pandemic hit us and of course now we are all used to the so-called uh, new normal. Uh, however, I can't really uh, wait to uh, see Mumbai back in its full glory with all the uh, buzz, uh, uh, you know, and all the, uh, uh, you know, all the crowds and, uh, you know, the general chaos of uh, Mumbai. Uh, which uh, which I am uh, currently uh, missing a lot. Just a few images of uh, where I practice. This is uh, in a suburb called Khar uh, in Mumbai, and this is where uh, uh, I've been uh, practicing dentistry now, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for over uh, 25 years. This is my lecture content. Uh, I'll be speaking uh, on uh, problems associated with the alveolar ridge resorption. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the uh, possible solutions for achieving uh, success in uh, the aesthetic zone. Uh, but my main focus in the presentation is going to be on uh, partial extraction therapy uh, and the surgical technique. You know, images like this uh, is something that most uh, implantologists would love to see. Uh, somewhere, uh, something where you uh, have a healthy peri-implant uh, soft tissue and a real robust amount of tissue which supports uh, a nice uh, uh, implant supported uh, uh, restoration. However, this might be your wish list, but uh, more often than not, uh, most of us who have worked in the aesthetic zone over the last uh, 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 few years uh, have uh, come down to accepting this as a reality that uh, irrespective of what technique and what biomaterial uh, or what implants we have used over the years, uh, by the time uh, we come to restoring the teeth or even following up these restorations over a period of time, uh, we start seeing, uh, you know, fairly disappointing uh, images like this where, uh, you know, all the effort that we have put during the surgery, uh, we have kind of lost that uh, over a period of time uh, due to uh, the continuous resorption of the alveolar ridge. Now, alveolar ridge resorption, as you would uh, understand, uh, you know, uh, happens uh, post extraction. So, from the day the tooth gets extracted, there is going to be some amount of resorption that, uh, that occurs. Now, uh, if one is lucky, uh, you might have resorption which is minimal. And we see this from time to time where uh, there is a really healthy, robust uh, ridge in spite of the patient not replacing these teeth uh, for uh, even a, a decade or more. Uh, at times, uh, we see a moderate amount of resorption post uh, extraction uh, and uh, sometimes we even land up with uh, extreme amount of resorption as you see uh, in this particular image where post extraction there has been so much of resorption that uh, it's virtually impossible now uh, to place an implant uh, in this much amount of bone. Uh, without needing uh, any uh, bone augmentation procedure. So, why does this happen and why are these inconsistencies in the amount of resorption? Uh, so, let's focus our attention a bit on this particular article by uh, Shapui and uh, Guza, uh, wherein uh, uh, they studied CBCT data uh, post extraction and uh, came to this conclusion that uh, if uh, there is less than 1 millimeter of facial bone post extraction, uh, there is a very, very high uh, chance of uh, losing that labial bone and leading with uh, a severe amount of, uh, uh, you know, uh, alveolar ridge uh, resorption. However, when the labial uh, uh, plate post extraction uh, is uh, about a millimeter or more, uh, the conclusion was uh, that uh, the amount of resorption uh, will be much less uh, compared to having, uh, you know, one, uh, less than one millimeter of uh, bone. Uh, or, or labial to the uh, root. So, this uh, uh, is a very significant finding because uh, we also know from data that uh, it is extremely rare to find, uh, you know, a millimeter or more of uh, labial bone, uh, particularly in the anterior maxilla. And so, for that reason, most of the cases that we land up extracting teeth uh, in the anterior maxilla uh, really land up with having moderate to severe amount of uh, uh, ridge resorption. So, let us try and understand what exactly happens over here. Uh, this is the tooth that uh, uh, presumably uh, needed uh, extraction 
and post extraction if we uh, focus our attention on the crest of the labial bone over here uh, what we see uh, is uh, your labial soft tissue below which uh, uh, you know uh, is the uh, labial bone and if you uh, look at the crest of the bone uh, which is uh, completely bundle bone and almost devoid of any uh, cancellous uh, uh, bone. Uh, so this piece of bundle bone uh, derives its blood supply uh, from the periosteum on the labial side and from the periodontal ligament from the palatal side. And this uh, blood supply which uh, it receives from the periodontal ligament side is actually very crucial for its, uh, uh, for its survival. Because what we see is once the tooth is extracted and we lose the periodontal ligament, uh, the next step uh, is actually uh, you know, resorption of that little uh, crest of the bundle bone. And as the bundle bone starts to resorb, uh, what we uh, start seeing are horizontal defects like this uh, over time. And this would happen irrespective of whether we have placed an implant in that socket on the day of the extraction or we uh, do a delayed placement. This bundle bone is lost forever. And uh, over a period of time, we also land up seeing uh, the soft tissue following that bone. So if there has been extremely thin amount of labial bone and you land up losing significant amount of that labial bone, over time you will start seeing uh, a lot of soft tissue uh, recession. And in spite of having that implant over there, it does not prevent that bone or the soft tissue uh, from receding. And this leads uh, to aesthetic failures, it leads to poor contours on the labial side and overall a fairly disappointing uh, end result. Now how often have we encountered this? We have seen uh, uh, some of our own cases where we have placed implants uh, in the aesthetic zone in the past. And we happen to see the cone beam CT scans of those cases a few years down the line. We are quite alarmed to see, uh, you know, almost no labial bone supporting that uh, particular implant. And this, I think, for clinicians who have been practicing now for, uh, uh, for, for several years, uh, would have noticed in many of their uh, follow-up cases. And how bad is this? Uh, you know, situations like this uh, are uh, not uncommon these days where implants have been placed uh, in the aesthetic zone in the past. And uh, over a period of time, uh, the patient uh, does land up losing that labial bone and then the soft tissue follows that labial bone and you land up seeing, uh, you know, sometimes the threads of the implants exposed. And then particularly in a young uh, female like this who has a high lip line, this can actually be a, a fairly disastrous uh, situation. So is there any solution and how can we put an end to this problem? So let's try and look at various solutions that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, exist uh, in literature. So, uh, you know, there are uh, basically three, uh, uh, you know, various uh, different procedures. Uh, one is the socket grafting procedure, second is the dual zone grafting and the third is uh, early implant placement with contour augmentation. So, these are the three main procedures that have been, uh, you know, tried in the past, uh, uh, very successfully documented and published, uh, uh, you know, on trying to uh, compensate for that uh, loss of uh, labial bone uh, in the aesthetic zone. The first is the socket grafting wherein uh, you know the uh, tooth or the root piece is extracted and the socket is grafting using a biomaterial and a membrane. Uh, the rationale for doing something like this is to prevent that uh, loss of the labial bone and the collapse from the labial side. Uh, but however, uh, you know, uh, this is one procedure where, uh, uh, where uh, you know, personally I have really had a fairly uh, inconsistent and at times very disappointing results that in spite of following the technique right and in spite of using the right kind of biomaterials, uh, I have not always uh, been able to maintain uh, the uh, dimension uh, of the alveolar edge, which means that, uh, you know, a few months down the line when I have gone into place implants uh, into uh, these sites, I have actually needed a second round of uh, augmentation. The immediate implant placement uh, again is an extremely popular way of, uh, of uh, rehabilitating patients who need uh, extractions uh, of the uh, uh, in, in the aesthetic zone and uh, over a period of time this has become extremely popular amongst clinicians. Uh, also from the point of view of patient, uh, you know patients uh, really love it when you are able to combine two surgical procedures into one which is do the extraction as well as place the implant uh, in the same surgical appointment. However, uh, in spite of doing uh, extraction and immediate placement cases and even grafting the gap uh, uh, between the implant and the labial bone and also extending that graft slightly into the soft tissue uh, zone uh, which uh, uh, is known as this dual zone grafting is something that uh, you know clinicians have been successfully doing over the years uh, in order to maintain uh, again the uh, dimensional to prevent the dimensional changes uh, that will occur in the alveolar bone uh, 
post implant placement. The third uh, very very successful uh, treatment uh, uh, procedure has been the early implant placement uh, by the uh, ITI group wherein uh, they propose extraction of the tooth and re-entering that site not uh, on the day of the extraction but four to six weeks post extraction. So essentially allowing the soft tissue to close and then re-enter that site, place the implant, uh, place in the uh, uh, graft material uh, and then do a, a delayed loading uh, of that uh, particular uh, implant and end up with a, uh, with a fairly pleasing uh, uh, solution. However, uh, you know, in spite of these uh, procedures, there is uh, something that has uh, been a game changer uh, in the past uh, decade or so uh, when it comes to uh, uh, placing implants in the aesthetic zone and that is the socket shield procedure uh, for preserving uh, the ridge as well as maintaining the soft tissue contours. So let me uh, give you a bit of, uh, uh, you know, a bit of history about uh, how this procedure uh, came about and what are the different terminologies that are being used worldwide to explain this uh, particular procedure. So the original uh, uh, technique, the socket shield technique is what uh, I think uh, most of us uh, know this uh, technique uh, uh, by, this, uh, by this term. The other term also is the root membrane technique uh, which is also uh, similar to the socket shield technique. And then uh, there is the partial extraction therapy or the PET which uh, also is a modification uh, of the original socket shield uh, technique. So how did this all come about? Uh, the socket shield technique uh, was initially conceptualized uh, by, uh, uh, by the Herzler group uh, uh, in 2010 and uh, this is when uh, uh, you know it really took off and clinicians from all over the world were quite excited about this new technique and those who tried it in the early days uh, tasted success and ever since I've been trying to uh, develop this uh, even more. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, the group uh, from Greece, uh, uh, spearheaded by Siompras and Mitsias, who also, uh, uh, you know, have been uh, practicing a similar technique, which they published uh, with their five-year data, called as the root membrane technique, which also uh, uh, is quite similar uh, to the uh, socket shield technique. Uh, going ahead, uh, uh, the group again uh, by uh, uh, Salama uh, brothers and uh, Gluckman uh, went ahead and uh, further uh, improvised uh, on the socket shield technique and came up with the very specific guidelines on how the shield needs to be prepared and how uh, the implant needs to be placed. And uh, they also uh, defined a few uh, other procedures along with the uh, socket shield technique, which is a root membrane technique. Uh, uh, which is the root submergence technique, I beg your pardon, uh, the socket shield technique and the pontic shield. So the partial extraction therapies actually comprise of three different procedures. Uh, one of the procedure is the socket shield which is, uh, you know, uh, associated with placing the implant uh, and rehabilitating that uh, site uh, with an implant supported restoration. Whereas the other two techniques which is the root submergence and the pontic shield uh, technique other techniques more uh, to uh, maintain uh, the pontic site uh, dimension uh, post extraction. The root submergence technique uh, as you would know is not nothing new. Uh, the Salama brothers uh, presented this uh, way back in 2007 wherein they actually uh, you, uh, place uh, you know left back uh, healthy root pieces uh, endodontically treated or even vital roots uh, to be submerged uh, 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 below uh, uh, potential pontic sites. Uh, the uh, rationale behind doing this was again to prevent that dimensional change that would occur post extraction and in order to achieve uh, really pleasing results uh, uh, you know and to be able to really contour those pontic sites so that you have a very very aesthetic uh, uh, pleasing uh, uh, pontic restoration uh, which uh, almost seems like it's uh, emerging from the soft tissue. Now let us focus our uh, attention on the uh, socket shield technique that is going to be the main focus of my presentation today. Uh, is uh, the step by step uh, technique of uh, performing this procedure. So let us uh, look at this uh, particular uh, pre operative situation. This is a case of a trauma wherein presumably this root need, uh, uh, needed an extraction uh, followed by an implant placement. Uh, over the years, uh, there have been various uh, kits that have been uh, designed by uh, clinicians who have been practicing this science. And one of the recent uh, advances is this kit, uh, uh, you know, designed by uh, Harvey Gluckman, uh, which I think is extremely comprehensive uh, set of drills uh, that are utilized for, uh, uh, you know, simplifying this procedure 
and to make it uh, uh, you know make it so predictable that anyone uh, who is actually trying out this procedure and following a protocol uh, should get consistently good results so we initially start off uh, you know entering the root canal and measuring the root length uh, this is uh, uh, the first step uh, once the root length is measured uh, uh, we start using the gates gliden drill now this could be uh, you know a case where uh, there was uh, old endodontic material so using the gates uh, gliden drill going all the way uh, to the apex and trying to remove off all the gutta percha from uh, uh, from uh, inside the roots root canals following that a lance drill is used uh, again following the same path uh, going down to the apex of the root uh, uh, after the gates gliden drill and then using uh, a small uh, headed round uh, you know round burrs with uh, very long shanks which will uh, enable us to go all the way down to the apex and then eliminate all the apical part of that uh, root and while doing so also thin out uh, the uh, labial part of the shield so the shield uh, needs to be thinned out from here on and uh, uh, in the kit is also uh, a very elegant drill uh, for uh, thinning out and finishing the uh, inner wall of that particular shield once the shield uh, is been thinned out and the apical contents of that particular root have been eliminated the next step is to uh, trim the shield down to the level of the bone so for that uh, this uh, particular drill is used uh, it's a safe uh, ended drill Uh, it's got uh, you know uh, just uh, 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 you know this part of it which is uh, going to help in thinning the uh, shield and taking it down to the level of the bone uh, once the shield is taken down to the level of the bone uh, the last step is now to create a little chamfer a uh, chamfer uh, is created with the help of this particular drill so that you end uh, end up with a shield which looks uh, uh, exactly like this Uh, wherein uh, you have uh, around two third of the length of the root, uh, which is uh, which forms a part of the shield. The shield is drilled all the way up to the level of the bone, and uh, a bevel which has been created, which is like a chamfer or S curve as we would call it, uh, which uh, actually helps in providing the uh, much needed prosthetic uh, space uh, for uh, the restoration that we will eventually be placing over the implant. So now that the shield has been uh, prepared uh, to this dimension the next step is to uh, plan the uh, uh, implant placement so for the implant placement uh, the drill uh, is uh, 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 is used uh, into the palatal bone uh, as you would know the palatal bone is the area where we would want to place the implant that is the area where we have the maximum amount of bone for uh, stability again looking at uh, the radial plane positions of the teeth and uh, the anterior teeth uh, in the maxilla would present itself in various forms and various inclinations and based on that uh, one has to plan the trajectory of our implants uh, again this uh, article by uh, gluckman and dutwa uh, highlight uh, this particular uh, aspect of uh, how the drill needs to be directed into this alveolar bone uh, so that you get your implant in the most uh, perfect trajectory uh, for uh, uh, for a final restoration so once the implant site is prepared in the palatal bone uh, the uh, uh, implant is then uh, placed uh, uh, into the osteotomy site and once the implant is placed the next step is to uh, try and make a provisional restoration uh, over that implant so a temporary abutment is uh, uh, is uh, fitted over the implant and a chair side provisional uh, restoration is fabricated uh, which uh, will again support the uh, soft tissue uh, architecture uh, around that uh, particular implant and this is where you see the uh, uh, space that has been created by uh, uh, you know by creating that s curve uh, this actually enables us to have adequate amount of uh, space uh, you know uh, to for the soft tissue to completely engulf that shield and prevent any kind of uh, exposure of that shield uh, to the uh, oral uh, oral environment uh, during the healing process so now coming to this question why are we doing all this why are we really taking the effort to prepare the shield and uh, you know preserve that part of the shield uh, so the biological rationale for this uh, in a way is uh, you know we are actually kind of cheating nature over here so if you remember in the earlier slide where i showed you where uh, you know we extract the whole root and as soon as we extract the root the periodontal ligament is lost and as soon as the periodontal ligament is lost uh, you start losing the uh, bundle bone so herein lies uh, the uh, the magic uh, in this particular technique uh, wherein we uh, leave this uh, part of the root which is uh, the shield which is actually attached to the labial bone with the help of the periodontal ligament so which effectively means that the periodontal ligament in this particular situation 
is unaffected and it is attached to the labial bone because of which the uh, bundle bone which is normally very prone to resorption post extraction remains intact. So this piece of bundle bone now derives its blood supply from the periodontal ligament, from the periosteum as well as a little bit from the cancellous uh, uh, part of the uh, alveolar process. By doing so what we are achieving is an intact labial bone uh, which will help over a period of time to support the intact uh, soft tissue. Let us look at some clinical cases now. Let me uh, start off with this young lady who was about to lose this maxillary left central incisor. Uh, there was uh, several attempts at endodontics in this tooth which failed. Uh, there was a periapical infection and the tooth was now planned for uh, an extraction. The first step is to decoronate the tooth. So get the tooth uh, crown out and get it down to the level of the bone, uh, sorry level of the soft tissue. Then using long shank uh, burrs like this, uh, we will, uh, you know, after measuring the root length, go all the way down to the apex and create uh, a section wherein you divide this root into a labial uh, section and a palatal section. Following that, the palatal part of the root is extracted. That's the extraction of the palatal fragment, keeping the labial absolutely intact. So all the way down to the apex. This can be verified by taking a radiograph to ensure that the apex of the root has been completely eliminated. If not, you can use the round burr like this and go down the root all the way to the uh, apex and uh, drill out the uh, apical contents. Next step is to use uh, the uh, drills from the shield uh, from the kit that I just showed you to start shaping the shield. So you start shaping the shield, uh, protecting the soft tissue using some kind of, uh, you know, uh, gingival retractors. And the shields are shaped as per the protocol that I explained uh, some time ago. Following that, uh, the implant placement, uh, in this case, we were planning for a screw retained restoration. So the trajectory of the implant had to come from the palatal side. Uh, we use some osho densification drills over here uh, to densify the uh, uh, osteotomy side uh, so as to achieve good primary stability for our implants. So this again is the osho densification principle uh, that's being used. Uh, that is the uh, implant that's being placed into the uh, uh, osteotomy site and here again lies the key in uh, the success uh, of the treatment. Uh, so number one point is that the implant should occupy the palatal bone. Uh, you also want to maintain a gap between the implant and the labial bone. Now this gap typically would be around a millimeter to millimeter and a half. Uh, the shield again needs to be completely immobile at the end of this treatment. Because if the shield is mobile, it is very prone to uh, loosening uh, and migration and maybe even uh, a failure of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the shield. So the shield being intact is actually uh, one of the keys to success uh, for uh, a, a, a socket shield procedure. The implants being placed, uh, the, the ISK value has been measured. Uh, the next step now is to fabricate uh, a, a provisional restoration, uh, a chair side provisional. Uh, so we uh, first uh, fill up the space uh, between the shield and the root piece uh, over there uh, with some uh, collagen sponge. Uh, we've attached a temporary uh, titanium, uh, temporary uh, peak abutment and using a silicone index, we fabricate uh, a chair side uh, provisional restoration. The restoration is then finished and polished uh, and uh, you know, uh, the uh, subgingival critical contour is created. Uh, so as to allow more soft tissue bulk uh, in that uh, area uh, immediately uh, 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 coronal to the uh, implant. That's the immediate uh, post-operative radiographic view. That's uh, how the tissue looked uh, four months down the line uh, when the patient reported to us and we, uh, for the final restoration, we unscrew the provisional restoration uh, and we then fabricate uh, a definitive restoration which is uh, uh, an Emax restoration with a zirconia abutment. Uh, that's how uh, beautiful the peri-implant soft tissue uh, looked. Uh, you see the uh, uh, healthy uh, tissue and more importantly, uh, you know, absolutely no loss uh, of uh, the labial contours uh, around this uh, particular implant. Uh, the crown was then uh, uh, fixed over the implant, that's the uh, post-operative radiograph and these are again uh, another view of uh, the beautiful emergence uh, uh, contour of that uh, uh, screw retained restoration uh, on that implant. 
Let's now uh, look at a, a, a surgery uh, a video. Uh, this is a, a case of a maxillary lateral incisor that needed to be uh, extracted. That's the cone beam CT scan. This is the initial sectioning, uh, dividing the root into the labial and the palatal fragment. So going down all the way to the apex, making sure that there is a complete separation between the labial and palatal. Following that, you apply pressure on the palatal part of the root uh, with very fine tipped elevators and mobilize the palatal fragment. Please note that the tip of the elevator is between the uh, alveolar bone on the palatal side and the, and the uh, uh, palatal fragment of that root. Very gently uh, extract that palatal fragment and there you see the root tip uh, also uh, which forms a part of that uh, fragment that we have extracted. We ensure that the palatal content is all removed, that there is no gutta percha left inside and the next step is now to start preparing the shield. We use uh, an instrument to just retract the labial soft tissue so that we do not uh, traumatize it. And then using uh, the drills uh, from uh, the kits, uh, we will first uh, uh, shape and thin out the shield, then uh, create the uh, bevel. Once the bevel has been created, uh, the next step is to now start with the uh, osteotomy procedure. Note again how uh, the osteotomy is uh, been done more on the palatal bone, uh, ensuring that the drill does not come in contact with the uh, shield. And same again with the implant, as the implant is being driven inside the osteotomy site, uh, you will notice that there is no contact uh, between the implant uh, and the shield. This is again something that uh, uh, you know uh, the PET technique uh, emphasizes uh, the importance of actually maintaining uh, a physical gap between the implant uh, and the shield. So uh, once a satisfactory torque has been achieved uh, on that implant, uh, uh, you can now go ahead with, pro with uh, fabricating a provisional restoration. For that we use uh, a temporary titanium abutment. Use some uh, uh, Teflon over there uh, so that the uh, material does not flow into the gap. We use a silicone index. Uh, the silicone index uh, will help us to uh, fabricate a chair side provisional restoration. Once the material hardens, uh, we will now retrieve the uh, crown from over the implant. The crown is now retrieved. We then attach it over an analog. Fill up all the voids with uh, flowable resin. And then uh, using uh, composite finishing uh, tools, we will then finish and polish the restoration uh, and provided uh, the much needed uh, uh, contour. After the final glazing is done, uh, the restoration is now uh, 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 placed over the implant. And that is a screw retained restoration over the implant. That's how it looks uh, on the radiograph immediately post placement and as you will well appreciate this is an immediate post operative view uh, wherein the soft tissues are very nicely uh, uh, supported. Coming to uh, the level of evidence uh, in this, uh, in this uh, technique, uh, over the years uh, you know from the time uh, uh, Herzler and his group uh, uh, came with the proof of principle uh, in the journal of uh, clinical periodontology uh, way back in 2010. Uh, various clinicians all across the globe have been uh, 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 presenting their uh, cases uh, 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 and, uh, and case series uh, in uh, various journals uh, uh, across, uh, across the globe. 
but it all started off uh, in 2010 uh, like i mentioned the herzlos group uh, came up with the uh, proof of principle for the uh, socket shield technique and then over the years uh, gluckman and salama presented uh, a retrospective evaluation of 128 socket shield cases uh, in the aesthetic zone uh, then again uh, the herzlos group came back in 2017 and presented uh, the socket shield technique with uh, a five year data uh, and uh, the group from korea uh, uh, the han and park uh, came up with uh, you know another case series uh, of the modified socket shield technique uh, in uh, 2018 there have also been human histological studies uh, with uh, you know the implant being in close proximation with the root and how uh, you know a bone has been demonstrated uh, in between the implant and the uh, and the shield uh, in this particular uh, histological study by uh, chuck schumer uh, and uh, and his group the root membrane technique uh, the greek group uh, came up with their 10 year data uh, and presented it in 2018 so they had almost 10 years uh, of uh, successfully treating uh, patients with the root membrane technique the journal uh, in pro of uh, uh, the journal of prosthetic dentistry again featured this uh, particular uh, article by uh, chuck schwimmer and uh, gluckman uh, wherein now they were extending the scope of uh, socket shield technique uh, and the partial extraction therapy uh, to uh, not just the aesthetic zone but also uh, uh, the non-aesthetic zone, uh, which is the multi-rooted teeth uh, in the molars. So as you see, uh, as it's evolving, uh, uh, you know, there are more and more uh, uh, publications, this particular publications, uh, uh, wherein uh, we uh, came up with a classification for different uh, uh, shield designs for different clinical situations. And one of the most recent publications, which uh, I'm extremely proud of, uh, something that uh, uh, we came up uh, uh, earlier uh, this year in January, uh, we actually uh, launched this uh, book uh, uh, published by Springer Publication on uh, partial extraction therapy. Uh, so for, at this point, I would like to acknowledge all my uh, co-authors here, uh, you know, Dr. Ali Tunkiwala, Dr. Narayan. Uh, Dr. Sudhindra Kulkarni, Dr. Tarun Kumar and uh, Dr. Payal who have been uh, you know following and uh, working on this uh, 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 on this technique for the last uh, seven to eight years and it's a combined effort and we uh, are very proud to uh, have come up with this uh, uh, you know this kind of a guidebook uh, on uh, almost every aspect of uh, partial extraction therapy starting from surgical techniques to modifications of the techniques, to complications, uh, to the prosthetic management. Uh, so just about every aspect uh, that needed to be covered uh, in uh, this publication, which has around 400 pages and uh, about 800 images. Also in the book are some of these frequently uh, asked questions. Uh, something that we always get asked is, what is the fate of the shield? Uh, so really the fate of the shield is such that the shield remains attached to the labial bone. And as we've seen in some of the histological studies, we actually can expect to find bone between the shield uh, and, the, uh, 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 and the implant surface. Another frequently asked question is, should the gap between the shield and the implant be grafted? The answer to that is uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, there is still no consensus on it. Uh, uh, personally, I do not graft this gap, uh, but I also know of some uh, very successful clinicians who uh, make it a point to graft that gap. Should the uh, implant be immediately provisionalized? Uh, the answer is again not necessary. The best thing would be to obviously have a well contoured provisional restoration. Uh, but if that cannot be achieved uh, for whatever reason, uh, the next best thing would be to make a customized healing abutment and form some kind of a prosthetic seal uh, over that socket. Can the implant placement be staged? So do we always have to place the implant after preparation of the shield? The answer again to that is uh, yes, uh, you can uh, uh, stage the implant. You don't necessarily have to place the implant on the same day. Something that we call as a glockers technique, wherein uh, we, we prepare the shield, we just graft the remainder socket and we go in at a later date and then place the implant into uh, uh, that uh, particular site uh, as a, a staged approach. Another frequently asked question and maybe to some extent a criticism about this technique is that uh, it's a technique sensitive uh, uh, you know uh, uh, technique not something which uh, uh, everyone can uh, uh, you know successfully uh, accomplish. So is there a learning curve to it and the answer to that is yes of course there is a learning curve to it uh, just like most other 
you know innovations and advances in dentistry uh, this also has been an innovation in the last decade or so and uh, there is a learning curve to it but uh, uh, but you know from my personal experience of uh, training a lot of clinicians uh, over the last few years in this technique i have can i can very confidently say that yeah once the protocols are followed and once the technique is uh, is learnt in the right way uh, uh, you know the success rates are extremely extremely high again for the success rates to be high uh, one needs to understand uh, case selection criteria for this and there are a few uh, absolute contraindications wherein clinicians should never attempt a, 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 a partial extraction therapy. One of them uh, is the uh, is mobile teeth. So never ever attempt uh, you know a socket shield or a PET on a uh, uh, on a mobile tooth. Uh, never ever uh, do it when there is no labial bone. So one of the keys for success is the intactness of the labial uh, bone, uh, which will be supporting the shield. So, if there is a clinical situation where there is a uh, where there is a dehiscence uh, 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 expected post extraction, that is not a case that has to be chosen for a uh, for a PET procedure. Again, when there is a very large uh, uh, cystic lesion uh, around the root, uh, one may want to defer uh, uh, a socket shield procedure, rather uh, you know go in with more conventional treatment approaches. Uh, and uh, 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 you know so sometimes even teeth which are not uh, suitably positioned in the arch. So this one for instance which is quite labially positioned in the arch and ideally post implant restoration you would want the tooth to get back into the uh, normal arch form. Uh, this might again be uh, a contraindication to uh, uh, doing a PET case. Uh, you would rather do uh, a conventional extraction and then go ahead and place uh, the implant so that you get the uh, tooth and the implant uh, in the right uh, position. Let me now highlight a few advantages, very obvious advantages uh, from personal experience uh, of uh, this technique over uh, the other techniques that we have done in the past which are the early implant placement and the uh, uh, extraction immediate placement and the dual zone uh, procedures. Uh, one of the uh, main advantages that I see uh, is the loss, uh, is the low morbidity in this uh, particular uh, technique. wherein. Uh, if you ever uh, do land up with uh, a failure which uh, you know something is something that we all need to accept that we do land up with failures at times and supposing the implant fails to osha integrate uh, the wonderful thing about this is that you still have a second chance of going ahead and placing an implant into the same site uh, and uh, you will also notice that the shield and the labial bone may still continue to remain intact and firm which means that it is still going to continue to support your uh, labial bone and the soft tissue so uh, having uh, uh, said that you can go ahead and place a new implant if need be you can even graft the gap in between and then end the case again with uh, a new restoration. The second advantage is the impeccable soft tissue that uh, one sees uh, over uh, when uh, cases are done with the socket shield technique. This is my first case I did it uh, about 7 years ago. Uh, this was a central incisor I did not know much about the technique back then. The tools that we use were not that refined as they are today. But nevertheless, I went ahead and restored this maxillary right central incisor. And when I see this same case over the years, I saw this once in 2014 and then back in 2018. And what really amazes me is the uh, wonderful uh, soft tissue around that particular restoration, which is intact almost from the day that I have uh, restored this tooth uh, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, until the day today. And to, and case after case, uh, uh, you know, in the aesthetic zone, be it a central, lateral or a canine, uh, we have been having uh, consistently good results uh, and been able to maintain the interdental soft tissue as well as the labial contours. A third uh, very obvious advantage over here again uh, is, uh, you know, to be able to treat adjacent implants, something that we have been struggling with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, past techniques of uh, restoring uh, adjacent implants successfully and more often than not we land up uh, you know with not very successful outcomes wherein we have to compensate uh, that little alveolar bone loss and the soft tissue loss uh, with a little bit of uh, you know pink ceramic as you can see in this uh, particular case. Uh, but not so uh, with the uh, uh, partial extraction therapy procedures wherein we are able to uh, maintain uh, the soft tissue contours, the interdental papilla and as you can see over here two central incisors uh, replaced with uh, impeccable soft tissues and interdental uh, papillas. 
and uh, again going case uh, after case uh, multiple implants that have been restored over here in the aesthetic zone uh, adjacent sites treated with PET. At this point now I also want to acknowledge uh, the PET research group uh, you know this is a group of highly motivated clinicians from all over the world and uh, uh, you know uh, this is a group of clinicians who are always pushing the envelope always trying to uh, you know innovate trying to make the procedure uh, simpler trying to make the procedure more uh, user friendly so that uh, you know uh, any clinician who is able to follow those protocols is uh, going to get similar results. Uh, the way uh, you know these clinicians are getting in their practices and uh, having said that uh, clinicians are now uh, you know almost making it a habit to do PET for uh, every single tooth in the arch not restricting themselves uh, to the aesthetic zone. Uh, we are now doing uh, PET even for posterior teeth uh, as you see in this case uh, a premolar and a maxillary molar. We are preparing the sites, uh, preparing the shields, placing the implants, maintaining the gaps there. And looking at this uh, at the end of four months, uh, we are again uh, looking at impeccable soft tissue uh, contours, no loss of uh, alveolar bone. Coming to the final frontier, you know something that uh, uh, most clinicians would uh, you know love to have in their practices is intact uh, soft uh, uh, tissue around multiple implants done in the aesthetic zone or sometimes even full arch cases. You know something that we've always wanted to do is to have uh, you know the classical FP1 prosthesis uh, uh, whenever we are doing full arch cases or uh, multiple implants uh, in the anterior maxilla. Uh, cases like this where there's a bridge failing in the anterior maxilla and we know this from past experience that if we extract these teeth and try to augment the site and go ahead and do implant supported restorations uh, in these particular cases, it's quite a, a challenging uh, 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 situation to be able to achieve a classical FP1 prosthesis here. Uh, but uh, using the PET pro principles and the techniques of submerging roots, preparing shields, uh, uh, preparing uh, uh, you know placing the implants, maintaining the right kind of gap and then making uh, provisional restorations, also combining this with some uh, uh, you know soft tissue procedures. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we did a pedicled uh, uh, palatal graft uh, in order to, uh, uh, you know, in uh, order to augment this uh, uh, pontic site, this old site uh, where there has been some resorption uh, using some tunneling techniques. So you see over here, we are combining PET procedure with some of the other advanced uh, procedures uh, uh, for augmentation of soft and hard tissue using this pedicle connective tissue graft and rotating it and uh, covering up the implant site as well as augmenting that uh, uh, pontic site. Uh, chest site uh, uh, provisional restoration was fabricated and then 48 hours down the line this is how it looks. This is the contours that we were able to achieve at the end of the healing process. Uh, we did some uh, uh, intraoral scanning for this uh, patient and then uh, got uh, uh, screw retained restoration fabricated and fitted over the uh, uh, implants again maintaining uh, the bone levels the crestal bone levels uh, you notice the submerged root over here again helping in maintaining uh, the wonderful uh, uh, soft tissue around uh, this particular pontic site that's how we started that's how we ended up those are the views and I would like to end up with this full arch case again as you notice uh, following the PET principles we are able to now treat these cases and end up uh, very predictably with a FP1 prosthesis. Uh, notice how you see multiple uh, 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 PET procedures, the root submergence, the pontic shields, the socket shields and all in all maintaining lovely uh, uh, peri implant uh, soft tissue contours. So my concluding uh, uh, statements here, uh, the socket shield uh, technique is very predictable for maintaining labial bone and soft tissue uh, around implants. The procedure is minimally invasive, it has very low morbidity, uh, it reduces the need for biomaterials which again uh, is uh, according to me a very positive aspect of this technique is that uh, you know the overall expense of the procedure uh, can be brought down by reducing the number of biomaterials that we, uh, that we tend to use. 
the medium term results are extremely encouraging uh, what we have seen in fact uh, groups have now gone on to even 10 year data so we are also started looking at long term results uh, which have been extremely promising uh, i have no doubt in my mind that this is a technique it's not a fad it's something which is here to stay and as we uh, as the years roll by i'm pretty sure that uh, you know clinicians uh, from all over the world are going to uh, embrace this and make it uh, you know almost like a routine uh, in their in their practices but one last uh, 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 statement is that this is not something for the novice surgeon uh, there is a learning curve like i mentioned during the presentation uh, but uh, it is something which uh, needs to be uh, you know uh, practiced and mastered but uh, and not something that that uh, you know somebody who is new to implants can uh, easily pick up and uh, get successful results so to those uh, uh, you know uh, relatively uh, new uh, you know beginners uh, in the field of implant dentistry i would uh, suggest that you know go ahead uh, do your uh, you know conventional uh, procedures uh, but at the same time learn these uh, new techniques uh, and uh, try and uh, get more proficient in it and i'm sure in the years to come uh, this will become uh, a, a very very useful tool uh, for you uh, in your implantology practice so with that uh, i would like to conclude and i would like to uh, thank all of you uh, for uh, uh, for your attention uh, once again my gratitude to the uh, fdi and the ida for uh, having me over uh, this virtual conference and like the rest of you uh, i am also extremely eager uh, to listen to some of the uh, fine clinicians uh, who would be presenting uh, at this uh, at this conference thank you very much uh, and stay safe all of you uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, as we all know it's far from over and uh, we are all in it together and we'll all get out of this uh, together so goodbye to all of you and my best wishes